are thrilled for the timeliness of this conversation. Philip Folsom is a a force to be reckoned with is is probably the best term I can use. And we are grateful to have him share about Wolf Tribe and his work with resiliency and the corporate structures and, and everything that he's bringing from his very, very deep background. Uh, we have a little video to show you, so take a look at this. That number one driver of health and longevity, of success in sales and organizational high performance, it's not a strategy or a technology. It's authentic and collaborative relationships. Wolf Tribe is a chance to come out and learn how to build yours. Wolf Peace is, a, is gonna be a really important through line of the things I wanna share with us because at the very root level, we are designed to operate tribally. And, and so when we wanna look back at how do I create a culture that is really healthy, like legitimately healthy and high performing. So we have to actually look back before we, we became part of what Krishna Murtry calls a sick society. And what we get to do then is that we allow time to process and reflect on our lives. What your treasure is from this journey is the freedom to live and to follow your bliss. Which means if you're brave enough to get through this hero's journey, you don't have to live life by other people's permission. Let's take all our power back. Let's build our tribes. Philip, welcome. We're so glad to have you. It's so an honor being us, here. Tell us, um, you know, just maybe share a story or two. We've just seen a video about the work that you're doing, which is phenomenal. And I know that everyone's going to have a lot of questions, mostly Amy. So. I have so many questions, <laughs> Philip. I'm just like, I've got them all written down. There are uh, 55, so I hope you have about five hours. Hey. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know if you guys do, but the, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people who are uh, tired these days are, are tired because of chronic stress and they're tired also because they're uninspired and out of alignment with what they're doing in their life. And so they're not passionate, they're not purpose driven, because when you are, one of the markers of, of being in alignment with passion is that uh, time goes quick. And so when I'm, when I have the blessing of getting to do this work, I would be here with you five hours, and at some point my wife would say, it's dinner time. But I mean, I, I could do this forever. I absolutely love this. This is why I'm on the planet, and so. So, Philip, I, I love your message. I love what you're doing for our communities. From your perspective, outside of the obvious, which is the current pandemic that we find ourselves in, what are some of the reasons that people are feeling uninspired these days? Mm. Uh it's many times about a connection to the service that we have of others. And so this is going to be one angle of approach to this big conversation is that we are a kinship based organism. We are designed at a cellular level to be connected to people that we are intimately and collaboratively and reciprocally engaged with. That's how we're born. We're born into a tribal system and what happens in our giant culture is that we don't have the ability to exist in those tightly knit kinship based structures and kinship is um, includes the same root word as the word kind and kindness so the, the way we treat our our kinfolk is with kindness and so we're no longer in that kinship based operating system or culture and we in anthropology we call that an honor based culture which means it's it's uh, defined by the relationships that we have with each other. And you can only actually top out at about 100 people to maintain that level 
of, I of intimate relationships. I actually saw that study the other day where that's what they said. They're like, don't even try to have more than 150 friends on Facebook because you cannot have a close relationship. It's, yep. it's, it's impossible psychologically to have more than 100 close kins. So we go from that honor-based uh, system, which is what is fulfilling to us, and we um, fall back into the, the kind of toxic world we were all born into, which is called pride. A pride-based culture, which is I need to get my needs met first. Mm -hmm. And I think all of your listeners will go, well, of course, you have to get your needs met first. And then we wonder why we're dissatisfied. And we wonder why we don't have a sense of purpose. And we wonder, like, what is the meaning of life? People in tribes don't think about that. It's very obvious what the meaning of life is. And it's called Ubuntu, which in Africa means I am because we are. Yeah. It, it, it defines purpose and meaning. It's inherent in our relationship with the service of others and all forms of heroism in the history of our species have come from honor-based cultures. Um, mm -hmm. Mothers will sacrifice themselves for? Your children. Right, soldiers sacrifice themselves for? Your team. Their, yeah, their brothers. Yeah. So if you don't have that level of motivation, inspiration, passion, then yes, you're feeling unfulfilled, mm -hmm. which is one of the, one of the uh, secret uh, purposes of, of my career is that I, I'm coming in the front door as a leadership and culture development person, and I'm going to yeah. make your team better. You're going to make more money. You're going to have more resiliency and engagement, all that good stuff. Yeah. What I'm secretly doing is I'm reintroducing a kinship, honor, and tribe-based culture into our corporations. That Don't tell anybody. Absolutely. Don't tell anybody. Okay. I, I won't tell anyone except when I post this on YouTube, I, I may share it with everyone. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but that's so interesting to me because when we talk about culture, we talk about, you know, this stewardship is like the number one value for us. And I'm resonating so much with that because there is so much of that, the tribal mentality and stewardship and taking care of each other. Mm -hmm. So how do you infuse that into a corporation? What are some of the things that you do to help people? And, and uh, you know, for our viewers as well that may or may not be in the workforce, how do you infuse that into your neighborhood and your community as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there is a very structured sequence of building a culture. And a lot of times uh, leadership just lunges straight into, ah, I'm managing people and I'm trying to get my needs met and my bottom line met and make these people happy. Um, studies have shown that we don't actually receive any formal leadership until about age 42. But we assume management leadership positions at about age 30. So there's this 10, 12 years train wreck of, I didn't really know what the hell I was doing and causing a lot of collateral damage. So uh, we are designed as a species to have been initiated with that tribal ancient elder wisdom at an earlier age when you became a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And then you have the understandings and the, the norms and the structural uh, belief systems of your tribe. And so one of those, that I am teaching uh, from straight anthropology, from, uh, this is a universal system, and it's called the tribe triangle. It is the sequence of how you build a tribe. It's the same sequence if you're building a championship sports team, an elite military unit, a pack of wolves, the same operating system. And it begins with the foundation of alignment on what is your, your vision or your why, what are your values, which is how, and then what is the specific thing that you're doing and that is the highest priority? So what are you hunting? That's your mission. That's and once interesting you because we have one page playbooks that we say who we are, what our values are, and what's the most important thing this quarter. And we align mm -hmm. as our number one priority all around us. So yep. that's very interesting. I can, using different language, I have seen the benefits of what you're talking about. And the same thing is true with families except instead of calling it the corporate language of vision and why, it's, it's your purpose, right? It's, or if you're in music, that would be your harmony. There, and there, so it's the same, um, I guess the fancy word would be a vector. Like we see the same systems showing up in different arenas. And for me, that's a lot of corroboration of, wow, that's the truth. And there, there are primarily three of these big, what I call master maps running under the hood of humanity. And that's a lot of the work that I do from a cultural or leadership standpoint is introduce work teams to that. Uh, once you, you articulate those three one more time. 
Yeah, the first one is that tribe triangle. It says okay. how you build a tribe. Uh -huh. and, and in a nutshell, it's alignment, which creates kinship, which right. creates healthy conflict, uh -huh. which then creates sustainable thriving. So you have to do those in the correct sequence, and that's called the tribe triangle. They're if you also try the conflict without the alignment. That just go, does not go well. Oh, it's a disaster. <laughs> it's like like when you tell a, a non kinship level uh, work team to hold each other accountable, you're going to see a bloodbath. Like right. like we have to build alignment first, and then we start looking at each other as an extension of ourselves, which is on a sports team, everybody recognizes. Right. Or if you're in a church, or if you're in a military unit, or a sorority, like, those are my sisters. And, and, and because of that, now all of a sudden I feel safe, I have belonging, I have resiliency, and it enables me to now engage in healthy conflict, which is speaking my truth, authenticity, mm -hmm. accountability, giving and receiving effective feedback. Mm -hmm. Most teams will fail right at that level because it's scary and it's hard and you start dealing with some old stuff. Yeah. So maybe but, some of the things that uh, some of the collateral damage that a manager who didn't have any management training. Spot on. on. Yeah. <laughs> spot on. Very interesting. So that's the first master map. The second one is the uh, universal way that humanity engages with the unknown. And mm -hmm. this is called the mono myth or the hero's journey. And if you uh, take any of the mythological or the teaching tales or the religious stories of any culture, it's only one story. It told over and over and over again with different characters and different, different sets running behind it, but it's the same story. And that story is all of our stories. And it's very encoded and very structured. And if we can learn that, we start realizing the skillful transition that we have to go through to be able to transition into the next phase of the adventure. Otherwise, and we so end the, up- The hero's journey is what some people call like the Odyssey, Odyssean journey where you've got the belly of the whale and you come out the mm -hmm. other, that's yep. the one I'm talking about, right? Okay. Exactly. And at some point, uh, you know, we were able to adventure, which is mm -hmm. when we need to do something, we have to find our purpose and our passion. And it's almost like uh, it's the dragon that comes threatening the village. And if you don't go to the dragon, it comes to your house or your work team or your relationship or your health. So go to the dragon is the first lesson of the hero's journey. Don't let it come to you. And one of my favorite quotes is, fate guides those who will and those who won't, she drags. So fate's gonna bring you anyway. So you and, might as well go willingly and lead it. Exactly, and, and at some point then you, you go fight the dragon right. and that's a, a, a a battle that you requ you require allies, you require a um, a development of a new operating system or or mastery or skill, and then you need to accept some sort of what they call supernatural aid, which is not a spiritual belief system as much as it is a surrender of um, how I'm engaging with this with reality. And then the the third phase is instead of fighting those dragons, ladies, what's a better thing to do with dragons? feed them game of thrones game of thrones oh i never watched game of thrones what is <gasps> me either oh my god oh my goodness oh no. secrets oh no. i know okay. i know be their mother be their mother no you ride them oh you ride them you don't yes because they're the most powerful <laughs> thing in the world is the dragons <laughs> so the dr and what the the metaphor is this is all metaphor they're not real yeah. dragons though. but the metaphor is whatever the insecurities the inadequacies the fears the abandonment the um, imposter syndromes that everybody's trying to hide from the world, yeah. those are your dragons. And if you learn, instead of fighting them, you start to incorporate them, all of a sudden you have your new brand, you have your, your secret sauce, you have your, your vision statement. And That is really fantastic. Carl Jung uh, puts that in a beautiful little statement. He says that any tree whose branches reach into heaven, the roots reach into hell. So part of this is looking at, yeah, that we're, we're suffering, we're hurting, uh, and we all are. And then how can we actually integrate that into our lives to become more resilient and more successful? And then we come home again at the end of the hero's journey with that lesson to, get, to give to our families and our work teams. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the hero's journey. That's the second master map. Oh my gosh, Philip, this is absolutely just incredible. I hope you have a book somewhere that I can buy. (laughs) 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 Because I have been, you know, as I've been leading my own team, I encounter a lot of these things. And and it is interesting as you work with people for two and three years and longer, and you get to know them, and you get to really care about them, and you mm-hmm. develop this kind of kinship, and then the things that you tell them will be received well, mm-hmm. and you can accept, you know, feedback from no matter where you are in the corporate structure. And now that's really interesting. Okay, so what's the third one? The third one, uh, and this one comes straight from the wolves, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, but the, the wolves are our first animal partner. They're our ally. They are actually the teacher. And the Native Americans call the wolf the teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so just to, I guess, answer a couple pieces about resiliency, and this has to do with humans or wolves, is that the number one source of resiliency is a sense of belonging. If, yeah. if, we, if we share that tribe triangle alignment foundation and we're in it together, we can process almost unlimited trauma, which is why we don't see suicide when our soldiers are deployed. We don't see suicides when the cops are out on in their, in their duty. It's when they come home and they don't have that support structure. um, They lose honor and kinship because this is the thing that makes us resilient. And so we need belonging. That's the first one. And we need the ability to adapt and adaptability is, uh, this is the pivot. This is what we're, we're all facing right now is endless, um, you know, the ability to pivot. And it's a very wrenching thing for uh, humans and all animals. Right. Uh, evolution is not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the most adaptable. So yeah. how do we become adaptable? And it's encoded in our operating systems that uh, we are specialists. Our, our tribe has primarily four different roles or buckets of behavior that are encoded in us at a very early age. Mm-hmm. And we got this from the wolves about 35,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. They, they, they learned this from an evolutionary standpoint, which is why they are the most adaptable animal on planet Earth. Huh. They, they discovered that there's these four primary roles. There's the alpha female, and she's always a female, ladies, by the way. Well, so... I know, right? <laughs> God, yeah, the mother of dragons. So <laughs> the, the alpha wolf of a pack is, yeah. is or, you know, it's matriarchal. And then there, there's your kind of what I would call a warrior wolf. These are the ones who are going on the elk first. These are the ones that are highly assertive. They're very aggressive. And then you have your specialist wolves, which are the ones that are the ones that teach. They're the, the ones that are sight hunters. They're the ones that are scent hunter. They're very specific very specialized. And then you have the, the fourth category, which is called the nanny wolf. Mm. And they don't hunt. Their job is to stay home and raise the pups of the, mm. of the breeding pair. And not all wolves breed, only the breeding pair breeds because they're tribal. Mm. They, are, they do, are not defined by my needs and my need to have this and that. It's us. Umbutu. Mm. So those four roles as very smart um, neuroplasticity, learnable humans, we scavenged off of those, that royalty of the earth, which was the wolf, and mm-hmm. we watched what they were doing, and we incorporated it. And so yeah. our, our operating system is uh, us leadership people, we stole this operating system, we called it DISC and Myers-Briggs and behavioral styles. So that's, that's how we are uh, introducing it into the front door. The, the whole the under the hood conversation is this is mythology yeah. the, the lessons are hidden right in front of us these are the four houses of Hogwarts yeah. these are the four characters in Lord of the Rings yeah. this is the characters in the Wizard of Oz and those four characters are the archetypes of humanity and they drive our 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 resiliency they drive our ability to adapt they drive they drive our collaboration skills and so that's the third master map, and it shows up over and over and over. Well, I could not agree more because my discipline is English and communication. And so I am so, I feel so aligned with those archetypes that you're mm-hmm. talking about. Um, as well as, you know, myth, and you talk about mythology, 
a lot of people think of a myth as an untrue sacred story, but a myth is a true or an untrue sacred story. But this, the, what's what's uh, relevant about it is that that it is sacred and that in the sense that it's special and it's tribal, like you say, and it's foundational. And so uh, it's what you're saying to me is just so, uh, so interesting because like you say, you go in the front door with, you know, your quantitative and qualitative data, but we're really structured this way to begin with. And And, so that's so interesting. And the word sacred is important. Uh, because it involves sacrifice. Mm-hmm. That, that, it, that's, the, that's the root of it. And, and we have to recognize that, you know, there is a cost to be paid for everything. And a lot of times we feel like we don't have to pay that. The, the word decide includes the same root as homicide and suicide. And so it, in Latin, it means to cut or kill. Mm-hmm. So when I decide to do something, uh, hire somebody, let somebody go, change a behavior, address an old habit. Uh, it's not free mm-hmm. because the, the sacrifice is coming. There are and so, consequences. And we have to make sure that we are, you know, we understand what the cost is. We understand that we can pay it and that becomes sacred. That's, that's, the, so that's the sacred nature. I love how you have taken what's like so foundational and, and instinctual and and brought what's good and what people have found to be adaptable and applying it to col- like to corporate culture. This is absolutely fascinating to me. So I know that Lauren is. I'm sure Lauren's like, okay, we gotta go. But uh, let me just ask you one more question. <laughs> Man, we just got started. <laughs> oh, this is so fantastic. We will definitely need to have you back for a we deeper a deeper do. dive. But well, go ahead, Aim. <laughs> All right. So final question. If you could have us as humans on this planet, in this pandemic, do one thing to be more resilient, what would it be? Oh, that's great. That's a great question. Um, I, I would, okay, let me answer this very quickly. Using the, using the four archetypes, um, they speak directly into resiliency. Uh, they, the four archetypes are the queen or the king, but y'all queens here, um, the warrior, the sorceress, magician, or the lover. And those are the same roles that we shared with the wolves and the same right. roles in the stories. It's Hogwarts. So they all, partic- they, they all provide a particular and vital resiliency need. And so here they are really quickly. Humans need hope. And, and number one, Napoleon called a leader, a dealer in hope. So that's, well, that's the job of the queen. And she goes, listen, I don't know how we're gonna do it, but this is the vision for the future and there is hope. And everybody goes, oh, thank you, you know, because I didn't have it. So number one, hope. Number two, the warrior is the one that defines boundaries, but also defines decisive action. We have to know that we have some sort of efficacy of impacting the world. There has to be some action or step we can take. And that's the job of the warrior. So we have to be able to understand that there is some control that we have in our world. Thirdly, we need a plan. It doesn't need to be perfect. If a human does not have a plan, we are forced psychologically to deal with all eventualities and it's crippling, it will paralyze you. So um, internally, ask your sorceress or your magician, hey, we need to come up with some sort of plan to be able to get through this career issue or this isolation issue. And uh, it doesn't need to be perfect, it just needs to be some sort of a plan. And lastly, this comes from that lover archetype, which is compassionate and empathetic and connected, we need belonging. And this is a really, really important piece. It's vital to realize that we are not socially distancing, right? That everybody's throwing that out there. We are physically distancing. Don't get it twisted. Mm -hmm. So stay connected with your people. Stay committed to your purpose. That's how we're going to get through this. And it's the same way we have always gotten through it. I could not think of a better way to say that. If we could all just internalize that, we'd be so much better off right now. Thank you so much. How do people, how do our viewers find you? How can they join you? How can they join your mission? Beautiful. Two things. Um, One, my shameless plug is um, mywolftribe.com. And I would love to come and serve organizations. And this is my sacred purpose on the planet. So even if it's just give me some advice or let's talk about what's going on or Any of these information, I would love to do that for you and your team. Uh, I have a a whole slew of remote programs, which are 
uh, really impactful and really fun. They look a lot like this, right? <laughs> um, so mywolftribe.com. And then secondly, and this is more of the sacred conversation, is our first responders are hurting. Our warrior class people are hurting right now. Our police, our fire, our first responders, all those trauma nurses who have beds in the hallways now, people, uh, they're hurting. So um, I have an organization called ValorResiliency.com. And we're rolling out resiliency programs uh, based around leadership, train the trainer, culture work. So if you know any people who need that work uh, organizationally or individually, please um, look us up there and, and we're, we're here to serve. Perfect. Thank you so very much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. And so much, so much. I hate to say this, we'll have you back and we Please. will be back. <laughs> okay. It was an honor, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.